This Jewish History Podcast, the final episode on the Yom Kippur War, is sponsored by Mike Fisher in loving memory of his father, Mayor Ben Feit of Yenta, who passed away this past year on the 19th of Av. Mike told me that his father was an amateur historian and would have been so delighted to be able to help contribute towards disseminating the story of the Jewish people. And of course, we thank him for his support. If you'd like to support our organization, Torch, in providing the Jewish History Podcast or any one of our other amazing podcasts, please visit our website, torchweb.org, or email me personally at rabbiwalbyajimo.com. You could also email me with any questions, with any comments, and any feedback. Before we begin, I would like to give a shout out to one of my other podcasts called Torah 101. It's a very different style, very different content matter than the Jewish History Podcast. It's going to address the critical philosophical foundations of Torah. We cover questions like the divinity of the Torah, who wrote the Torah. We examine the written Torah and the oral Torah and how they interrelate. We delve into questions of Torah and science. We go through a very thorough examination of Rambam's 13 Principles of Jewish Faith If you're interested in thoroughly examining the fundamental tenets of Torah, then the podcast Torah 101 is for you. And I'd also like to give a plug for one of my other podcast channels, the Parsha Podcast. It just began its fourth cycle. Of course, we just had Simchas Torah. We just finished completing the annual reading of the Torah. And there's no better time to jump on board on the Parsha Podcast We're starting a new cycle every week. There's going to be two episodes, one that covers the entire Parsha, one of them that zones in on an idea, a theme, a concept from that week's Parsha. Check it out, the Parsha podcast with Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. We left off last time with the Israelis crossing over the canal and arriving in Egypt in Africa. And with the crossing of the canal, the Israelis had to make several important decisions. The existential war was over. There's no longer a threat of national catastrophe. Now, really, Israel had the cards, and while they did not choose to start the war, they would be able to determine how the war was going to end. All opinions agreed that Egypt must be thoroughly punished for instigating the war, But how exactly to go about that was a subject of intense debate. Advancing to Cairo was ruled out because it might invite the Russians to intervene, and it would also necessitate maintaining a long and vulnerable supply line. Instead, they decided to advance south, 35 miles from where they were currently located on their beachhead in Africa, to advance the city of Suez, Suez City, to encircle and besiege the Egyptian Third Army, currently entrenched on the east bank of the canal south of the Great Bitter Lake, to cut off their supply lines and to suffocate them. This was not going to be easy at all. By Thursday, October 18th, Egyptian tanks and infantry had amassed around the Israeli bridgehead in Africa, and the Israelis would need to fight their way out if they wanted to expand it. The initial force of the Israelis in Africa was reinforced with tanks brought from the northern front. They launched an assault to try to break out of the bridgehead, but they encountered heavy anti-tank and infantry resistance, and they were repelled. On Thursday afternoon, a second assault was also repulsed, and the Israelis called in air support, but as had been plaguing the IAF, the Israeli Air Force, throughout the whole war, before they could provide the air support for the ground invasion, the SAM missile sites had to be disabled, so they sent two battalions on raids to go do that. And after destroying many of the SAM sites, Israeli Mirage aircraft swooped in and shot down many Egyptian MiG planes. And it's ironic that normally you have the Air Force providing aid for the ground forces, and here with the Israeli battalions on the ground, you have the opposite the ground forces are aiding the air force. So after one day of fighting to expand the bridgehead, the Israelis made some progress, but not enough to really break out into the enemy rare, into the open desert. That would have to wait until the following day, Friday, October 19th. By this time, 
Egypt had moved some of their missile sites out of the immediate area because they were scared of the Israeli raids. So finally, the Israeli air power was unleashed to be able to operate unmolested in the skies of Africa. On Friday, the Israelis broke through on two axes and began marching through the desert southward, stopping ever so often to destroy military and sand missile and artillery sites. In one day, they covered 22 miles, more than halfway towards their destination. While Adan's division moved south, Sharon's division headed north towards Ismailia, clearing out labyrinthine trenches, placing Israeli flags along the ramparts on the west bank of the canal to rattle and to demoralize the Egyptian second army on the Sinai as they got the feeling that they sensed quite accurately that the Israelis on the other side are cutting them off from their homeland. The Egyptians were so committed to maintaining their bridgeheads on the east bank of the canal that they refused to withdraw their brigades back west to stop the Israelis. In fact, in a meeting with his top generals, Egyptian President Sadat said, quote, we will not withdraw a single soldier from east to west. But despite his defiant posture, Sadat immediately asked the Soviets to impose a ceasefire at the United Nations based on existing lines. The Soviets reached out to Kissinger, who in his diplomatic and political shrewdness, he wanted really to have everything. He wanted the American client Israel to win, but not to totally embarrass the Arabs, make sure the Soviets have a role to play, albeit a minor supporting role to America. And this he viewed correctly as a great reshaping of the Middle East. And he wanted to drive a wedge between Russia and her Arab allies and to pivot, to push, to nudge the Arabs a little bit closer to America as as their hope. So Kissinger, he agrees to fly to Moscow on Saturday, October 20th. Incidentally, that night is the so-called Saturday Night Massacre when President Nixon fired Watergate Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. In Moscow, Kissinger found Brezhnev very eager for a ceasefire. The Israelis, they weren't really too confident of their battlefield prospects. They didn't implore Kissinger to delay So it seemed likely that a ceasefire loomed. And Kissinger informed the Israelis that around Monday, October 22nd, two days from that meeting, you should expect a ceasefire. And this really put a lot of pressure on on Israel. Whatever military accomplishments you wanted to do, there's a countdown. Now time is of essence. Meanwhile, in Syria, the Syrian high command planned a major counterattack together with the Jordanians and the Iraqis. The attack was both poorly planned and executed clumsily. The Jordanians in particular, they caused confusion because their tanks were virtually indistinguishable from Israeli tanks. So you have all this chaos where the Syrians and the Iraqis are firing on the Jordanian Sherman and Centurion tanks, and the Jordanian tanks are undetected by the Israelis, there's mass confusion. But the movements of these three armies were not properly coordinated, and despite heavy losses on both sides, the attack was repulsed. On Saturday, October 20th, Adan's division advanced the final 13 miles south towards Suez City. Along the way, of course, They're continually destroying missile bases and severing the supply lines of the Third Army. They cut the Suez-Cairo railway line and they destroyed one of the highways linking Suez to Cairo. And by Sunday, the Egyptian Third Army, that's again the army that is in the southern sector of the Suez Canal region, was almost entirely encircled by Adan's division, and Sharon's division was 10 kilometers outside of Ismailia. Meanwhile, on the east bank of the canal in the Sinai, the Israelis continued expanding their corridor, beating down the dwindling resistance in the Chinese farm, and pushing the Egyptians away from the corridor. In those battles, there was a single Israeli tank commanded by Captain Mendy Feibush 
that racked up one tank. They destroyed nine enemy tanks, 15 enemy trucks, some of them filled with troops, and six destroyed APCs, armored personnel carriers, and numerous infantry positions, even though, sadly, Captain Fibush would die later that day in the battles. Hundreds of Egyptian soldiers, they sought refuge by taking shelter over the Israeli-built ramparts on the east bank of the Suez. But by doing that, they exposed themselves to easy pot shots to the Israelis on the west bank of the canal. According to Sharon's aide, Sharon ordered that the attack from the west to the east side of the canal be stopped because it looked too much like a massacre of the defenseless Egyptian soldiers. Masses of Egyptian soldiers began to surrender, were taken prisoner. Sharon was then ordered to attack the next highly fortified position, nicknamed Missouri, adjacent to the Chinese farm. This position was swarming with Egyptian personnel and Egyptian armor and had resisted Israeli attacks the entire war. And it was now actually reinforced by units retreating from the Chinese farm. And they were only given two dozen tanks to attack. And that seemed suicidal to the diminished forces on the Sinai side of the canal. But the order was unambiguous. It was an order. And what ensued was an absolute wild melee of a battle. Tanks firing in all directions. Egyptians falling like flies. But the attacking Israelis suffering punishing blows as well. The attack was doomed from the start. Maybe it was even foolish. It resulted in heavy losses, but ultimately the Egyptians withdrew, and after many bitter battles, the corridor linking the Israeli contingent in Africa on the on the west bank of the canal was doubled to five miles wide. In the north, the Israelis still had one more objective to seize. The observation post on top of the Hermon Mountain, it was captured on the first day of the war, and it was of vital importance to the Israelis, and it had to be retaken before the inevitable ceasefire. The first attempt to recapture it by Golani troops on October 6th was aborted, and as the war was winding down to its conclusion, it was imperative to recapture the Hermon. But the Syrians, they were equally determined to maintain that territorial gain from the beginning of the war. And thus, the showdown. The Israeli plan called for it to be assaulted by a team of paratroopers and by a team of Golani commandos. And on Sunday, 21st of October, Israeli Air Force Chinook helicopters delivered 600 paratroopers and infantrymen to the top of the mountain in 27 different sorties, the route of the helicopters weaving around Syrian anti-aircraft fire. The commandos were given a much more brutal mission. The 400 Golani soldiers, they would be climbing the steep 4,000-foot ridge at night, each one of them carrying a 75-pound backpack to reach the outpost, and at any time along their ascent, a battle could erupt. And erupt it did. Israeli reconnaissance had not spotted any Syrian soldiers, but the truth was that the Syrians had spent the days leading up to the showdown concealed behind the rocks and the boulders and in the the clefts in the mountain and lying in wait for the inevitable Israeli assault. And as these 400 Golani soldiers are three-quarters of the way up the ridge, they're suddenly attacked by the Syrian soldiers lying in wait. And this very close and very bloody and brutal battle ensued. And the descriptions are a little bit hard to read. But this firefight is commencing at such close proximity that they actually found a dozen Golani troops dead with bullet holes through their helmet. That's how close the battle was. Now, remember, this is all happening in the dark, and you have descriptions of soldiers bayoneting each other in middle of the night. But ultimately, the Golanis kept on grinding ahead, despite the many casualties, and ultimately, the paratroopers that had helicoptered in 
suffered one dead and four injured, but the Golani commandos had lost 55 men and 79 injured. But at dawn, the fighting slowed, and soon enough, the Syrians that remained surrendered, and the victorious pronouncement was made on the radio, the Hermon is in our hands. On Monday morning, the United Nations Security Council announced that the ceasefire would go into effect at 6.52 p.m. that evening. Israel had about 12 hours to fulfill its objectives. With intensive aerial support, Avraham Adan was slowly cutting off the Third Army's supply routes, and they began pushing east towards the canal. They wanted to make sure that by the time the ceasefire went into effect, they would actually be on the banks of the canal, and they were working feverishly throughout the day to do that, but by the time the ceasefire came, there was still a major Suez-Cairo route that was not yet severed, and the Third Army was not yet cut off. They had not finished their objectives in time. A few minutes before the ceasefire, leaving, of course, no time for Israel to retaliate, Egypt devilishly fired a massive bombardment of mortars, artillery, Katyusha rockets, at least one Scud missile at Israeli positions on both sides of the canal, inflicting tremendous damage. This ceasefire was going to be a very tenuous one. Right away after it goes into effect, you have reports of Egyptians conducting multiple violations of the ceasefire. And in all fairness, it seems like the Israelis were probably also guilty of violating the ceasefire. And frankly, Kissinger hinted that the Americans would look the other way if Israel finished mopping up. So Dayan approved the request to allow Adan to finish the job and completely encircle the Third Army, which he did. And by Tuesday night, the Egyptian Third Army, with its 30,000 men, were stranded on the Sinai side of the canal, totally cut off, totally surrounded, without any supplies, no water, no food, no medicine, no ammunition, totally at the mercy of the Israelis. After frenzied and frantic negotiations between the Soviets and the Americans, a new ceasefire was scheduled for Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., and they sent a team of international observers to go make sure that there's no violations of the ceasefire. In the meantime, the Israeli military brass made the disastrous decision to attempt to swiftly capture Suez City, the main hub, of the Egyptian Third Army before the ceasefire went into effect. And because of the haste of this attack, it was not well planned, it wasn't well executed, and it turned into a colossal failure. They didn't really have good information about the city. The maps that they had were woefully incomplete. They had no aerial photos. They really had no idea of the extent of the city's defenses, and they went in blindly. And to make matters worse, there was no strategic importance of capturing Suez City. The Third Army was already cut off, and there was no real reason to do it. Moreover, the initial strike force commanded by Yossi Yafi was ill-equipped. They only had nine captured Soviet APCs to enter the city blind, presumably in anticipation that the Egyptians would just raise their hands and surrender. So the Israeli convoy begins their cavalcade throughout the city. And things are quiet, but when they arrive at the second intersection, grenades, RPGs, and gunfire rain down upon them from all directions, destroying tanks and causing scores of wounded and dead. There were columns of paratroopers that were also entering the city. They were savaged by relentless Egyptian fire, and 90 of them, including 27 injured, they had to escape or they tried to escape, and they ended up in a building in the middle of the city after the Israeli armor withdrew. And they would have to attempt to withdraw from the city on foot through two miles of hostile urban environment with lookouts reporting that the Egyptians were set up all along the street waiting for them to try their escape. And given the intensity of this battle up to that point, 
they were certain that the Egyptians would take no prisoners. There was no hope for a nighttime rescue operation, and a daytime rescue seemed unlikely as well. And at around 2 a.m., a definitive order came in, move out of the city. Carrying several wounded on stretchers, the ones who could walk hobbling along, they began to make their way through side streets to the Israeli lines outside the city. Egyptian soldiers were everywhere, but after an excruciating two-hour walk, they made it to the Israeli lines. This Suez City expedition, the final battle of the Yom Kippur War, resulted in 80 dead and 120 wounded with absolutely nothing gained. The war ended with the Israelis controlling much of the west bank of the Suez Canal, with the Egyptians controlling much of its east bank. Despite the woeful beginning of the war, at its conclusion, Israel held more territory than it did at its beginning. Egypt was in control of 1,200 square kilometers in the Sinai, but the IDF held 1,600 square kilometers in Africa on the west bank of the canal, plus 500 square kilometers in Syria. The conflict now moved full steam ahead into its geopolitical and diplomatic phase with Russia and America jockeying for control of the situation. With the Third Army surrounded and the roads to Cairo wide open for the Israelis, the Egyptians and Soviets were justifiably panicking. And the Soviets sent the Americans a threatening message about an intervention The Americans reply, if you send, we send. If you engage, we engage. On Wednesday, Israel offered to allow regular soldiers safe passage, provided that they don't take their weapons, and the officers to go into Israeli custody to be exchanged for Israeli POWs. So that refused. There were diplomatic letters that were exchanged. There were tense meetings held in Washington and Moscow. The Americans went on DEFCON 3 alert. Eventually, things cooled down and a UN force was dispatched to the region. The Third Army tried unsuccessfully to break out, and Israel was unwilling to allow anything to come through its lines unless Egypt agreed to maintain direct talks with the Israelis, which to everyone's amazement, they did. Provided that a non-military convoy could pass to the Third Army, and a total ceasefire was imposed, they'd be willing to send a representative to meet the Israelis. And indeed, on Sunday, October 28th, 22 days after Yom Kippur, Israeli Major General Aharon Yariv and Egyptian Major General Abdel Ghani al Gamasi met in a desert tent labeled as Kilometer 101. They were still surrounded, and the prospects of a ceasefire being broken loomed large. The military establishment was nervous about the awkward layout of the Israeli forces, the long and tenuous supply line. Moshe Dayan was in favor of finishing the third army off and moving on to the second army. Sharon wanted to attack the second army. He felt it was a greater threat to the corridor. But ultimately, Eli Zeira made the salient point that by attacking the vulnerable Egyptians, it would make Sadat less agreeable to a settlement. And indeed, when Kissinger met Sadat two weeks after the war, they struck an agreement to do a prisoner exchange and a ceasefire agreement and to allow the Israelis to inspect the UN supply vehicles to ensure that there were no military paraphernalia aboard. And the agreement was signed at kilometer 101 between the Israeli and the Egyptian representatives. Egypt and Syria, while brothers in arms in war, they took opposing paths afterwards. Sadat right away began to make overtures towards Israel. He sent a letter to Golomeir via Kissinger. But Assad was committed to the view that Israel is illegitimate and he refused to acknowledge them in any way. In December, a formal international conference was held in Geneva. It was attended by the foreign ministers of Israel, of Egypt, Jordan, the Soviets, and of course presided over by Kissinger. This was the first time that Israeli foreign ministers sat at the same table as their Israeli counterparts. Syria opted to not attend, and they left a chair 
ceremoniously unoccupied to hint at the missing party. In the conference, they laid down the framework for an official disengagement agreement, hammered out thanks to Kissinger's wizardry and determination in what became known as shuttle diplomacy. He would shuttle back and forth between Middle East capitals, and Kissinger eventually got the Israelis and the Egyptians to agree upon a disengagement in January of 1974. In June, a deal was signed between the Israelis and Syria, wherein the prisoners would be exchanged and Israel would forfeit the enclave captured after Yom Kippur and they'll return to the Purple Line. Syria agreed to withdraw troops to the line as well and to station UN troops alongside the border. This past July, I was actually in the Golan Heights and you could actually still see the building. The United Nations forces that have been there since 1974 are still there. I want to discuss briefly the fate of the troops stuck in the fortresses along the Barlev line. The soldiers still alive in the 16 forts along the Barlev line on the canal during the first week of the war, they were going through tremendous hell. Surrounded, overrun by their mortal enemies, despite several valiant attempts, they're unreachable by their comrades, under constant, relentless shelling, Piles of dead and wounded everywhere due to this unbearable torture and hopelessness. There are stories of people attempting suicide and one wild story of a poor chap who went mad and grabbed an Uzi and started shooting wildly at his comrades and he had to be restrained by them. And of course, each fort had its own saga. Some of them had quite dramatic resolutions. Some forts had no choice but to surrender to the Egyptians Others attempted harrowing escapes through the Egyptian lines and managed to reach the Israeli line. So, for example, the 32 survivors at the fort called Purkan began walking through the Egyptian lines after the moon went down. It's 2.45 a.m. and they managed to rendezvous with Israeli tanks and survive. The 42 survivors at Fort Milano They were ordered to reach Israeli lines by foot, which worked out well until they were spotted by an Egyptian patrol and they had to retreat back to the city of Kantara. When they finally did approach the Israeli lines, they faced a different problem. The Israelis would assume that they were Egyptian and shoot at them. So one guy took out a prayer shawl, a talit, and waved it as a flag to indicate that they were Jewish. Sadly, that same soldier, Ilan Didron, He died on October 19th in Africa. Other attempts to try to escape back to the Israeli lines were not as successful. One group was spotted. They ended up being holed up in a building. And most of them died when the Egyptian tossed in grenades, the place where they were hiding out. A different group was maneuvering in the darkness. And they jumped out of their tank right in the middle of a group of Egyptian soldiers. There's one story of an Israeli soldier who spoke flawless Arabic. And it was assumed that he was an Egyptian soldier and he was tended to by the Egyptians throughout the night until the morning when they recognized that he was Israeli because of his uniform and they imprisoned him. All told, on Yom Kippur afternoon, there were 441 men stationed in 16 forts. Of those, 126 of them were killed, 161 of them were taken prisoner, and 154 including the 60 in Fort Budapest, the only fort to withstand the war, they managed to make it back. The story of the Yom Kippur War would be incomplete without mentioning the atrocities, the war crimes committed against Israeli prisoners. Both the Syrians and the Egyptians ignored the Geneva Conventions and tortured or killed Israeli prisoners of war. There's testimony of these atrocities happening There's also instances where Israeli POWs were videotaped as prisoners and whose remains were returned to Israel, and that obviously indicated that they were killed in captivity. But the stories, especially of the Syrians, they had a degree of brutality that's on a different level. The torture of the Israeli prisoners of war was cruel, was sadistic, and was barbaric. There are stories of them applying electric shots 
to the genitalia of captured soldiers, ripping off fingernails, converting defenseless POWs into human ashtrays as the Syrian guards burned them with lit cigarettes. In one horrific, gruesome, and macabre episode, a Syrian soldier killed 28 Israeli POWs with an axe, and then he began eating one of them. And outrageously, the Syrian defense minister awarded him with a medal of honor for his actions. I want to mention briefly also some of the other angles of this conflict that we didn't really talk about. So the war beyond the land war, the clash of the armor, the aerial war, it also saw ferocious and innovative naval battles. There were other Arab armies that participated against Israel. So we spoke about Egypt and Syria, of course, Iraq and Jordan and Algerian and Moroccan and Libyan and Kuwaiti troops also engaged against Israel. And there was even a squadron of North Korean pilots that flew cover over Egyptian air bases. In fact, in Ismailia, there was a gargantuan monument shaped like an AK-47 with an attached bayonet. It's actually kind of cool to look at, to be honest. You can see pictures of it on the internet. It was a gift, this monument from North Korea to Egypt to celebrate the fact that Ismailia was not taken. And of course, another aspect of the war that we mentioned briefly was the oil embargo that led to the worldwide energy crisis of 1973. The final tallies of the war were staggering. I want to read to you from Rabinovich's The Okipa War. Given the strategic, tactical, and psychological dimensions of the Arab surprise, Israel's recovery from the edge of the abyss was epic. The IDF destroyed or captured 2,250 enemy tanks. Hundreds of those were captured intact after being abandoned by their crews, mostly on the Syrian front. The IDF would incorporate 400 of them into its own ranks, enough for more than one division. 400 Israeli tanks were destroyed. Another 600 were disabled, but returned to battle after repairs and almost every Israeli tank had been hit at least once. Although largely neutralized over the battlefield by the SAMs, the Air Force had performed spectacularly in air combat. The IAF claimed 277 Arab aircraft shot down in dogfights with a loss of six Israeli planes, a 46 to 1 ratio that outdid the 9 to 1 ratio of the Six-Day War. In all, the Arab air forces lost 432 planes, including losses to Hawk missile and anti-aircraft fire, not infrequently their own. Israel lost 102 warplanes, almost as many to conventional anti-aircraft fire as to missiles. Had the superpowers not imposed a ceasefire, Israel's success would doubtless have been even more striking, but the price had been heavy. Israel lost 2,656 dead and 7,250 wounded. Arab casualties, as given by a Western analyst, were 8,528 dead, 19,000 plus wounded. Israel estimated Arab casualties to be almost twice those figures, 15,000 dead and 35,000 wounded. So who won the war? Again, I want to read to you from Rabinovich's The Yom Kippur War. Who won? Egypt did. So did Israel. Like a jeweler cutting a precious stone, Sadat had struck with his military mallet perfectly producing a political process that would lead to the recovery by Egypt of all of Sinai. More important even than the territorial gain was the performance of the Egyptian army, which wiped clean the Arab humiliation of 1967. Politically, Egypt's victory was stunning, but it brought with it an Israeli political victory even more stunning, namely peace with Egypt itself and the long-awaited breakthrough, however tenuous, to the Arab world beyond. In terms of morale, Egypt was a clear winner. It had seized the initiative, risking the shattering prospect of another defeat, and emerged honorably. As for Syria, it had been saved from crushing defeat by the intervention of Iraq. Key elements of Syria's physical infrastructure were smashed, and the country would suffer blackouts 
from the lack of electricity for months after the war. But it won at the negotiating table what it had failed to achieve on the battlefield, namely the city of Kanitra. But it did so without having to pay a political price in the form of recognizing Israel. Syria would subside once again after the war into sullen insularity. Unlike Egypt, which rebuilt its heavily damaged canal cities, Syria left Kanitra in ruins, a monument to ongoing hostilities. In Israel, the abrupt fall from supreme confidence, not to say arrogance, shook the nation to its core. The brutal surprises of the war had confronted it with the prospect not just of defeat, but of mortality. The psychological shock found insufficient remedy in military success. Despite the entrapment of the Third Army and the momentum Israel was building on the road to Cairo, it was Egypt, not Israel, that was gripped by the sense of triumph when the shooting stopped. Time would bring a different perspective. In military terms, Israel would recognize its achievements in the war as having few historical parallels. Reeling from a surprise attack on two fronts, with the bulk of its army still unmobilized and confronted by staggering new battlefield realities, Israel's situation was one that could readily bring straw nations to its knees. Yet within days, it had regained its footing. And within less than two weeks, it was threatening both enemy capitals. Israel faced not just the Egyptian and Syrian armies, but much of the Arab world. And it did so with the arm it had relied upon most, the Air Force, tied behind its back. As a military feat, the IDF's performance in the Yom Kippur War dwarfed that of the Six-Day War. Victory emerged from motivation that came from the deepest layers of the nation's being and from basic military skills that compensated for the grave errors of the leadership. For Egypt, the war was a towering accomplishment. For Israel, it was an existential earthquake, but one whose repercussions were ultimately healthier than those of the Six-Day War. The trauma of the war's opening was not a nightmare to be suppressed, but a national memory to be perpetuated, a standing reminder of the consequences of shallow thinking and arrogance. Israel's battlefield recovery in turn reflected a society with the will to live and a capacity to improvise amidst chaos. Israel would bear its scars, but it would be sustained by the memory of how, in its darkest hour, its young men mounted the nation's crumbling ramparts and held. The clearest victor of the Yom Kippur War was President Sadat. Risking it all, he had parlayed an audacious military move that restored Egypt's dignity into an audacious diplomatic process that restored its lost land. Addressing the Egyptian parliament on November 9th, 1977, four years after the war, he said, quote, I am prepared to go to the end of earth, and Israel will be surprised to hear me say to you, I am ready to go to their home, to the Knesset itself, and to argue with them there. Ten days later, he gave wings to the diplomatic process with a flourish no less breathtaking than the crossing of the canal. Sadat's arrival at Israel's Ben Gurion airport at the invitation of Prime Minister Menachem Begin was one of the most dramatic moments in modern Middle East history. On the reception line, Sadat asked Begin if, quote, General Sharon, who was now agricultural minister, if he was present. The Egyptian leader smiled when he shook Sharon's hand. I tried to capture you, he said. If you attempt to cross the west bank of the canal again, I'll have you arrested. From the Knesset podium, Sadat proclaimed no more war. But the momentous glory of peace would only come five years after the war. Immediately following the war, Israel was mired in a national state of gloom due to the staggering loss of life and treasure. During the war, they'd spent the amount equivalent of one year's GDP, coupled with the utter lack of negligible gains from the war. Thousands began protesting outside the prime minister's office. One famous protest sign read, Grandma? Your defense minister is a failure, and 3,000 of your grandchildren are dead. When Dayan would walk on the street, they'd stream at him, murderer. The leadership, of course, all blamed each other. Prime Minister never professed to be a military strategist. She always said that she relied on her advisors. The chief of staff, David al he blamed the politicians for failing to prepare for a surprise attack and for failing to mobilize 
the reserve forces early enough. The defense minister, Moshe Dayan, he blamed the IDF for their failed concept and for not recognizing the anti-aircraft and anti-tank capabilities of the enemy. One of the books that I read speculates that throughout the war, Dayan was already planning his deflection of blame by taking repeated pointless trips to the fronts. The public mood soured towards the leadership cabal in December of 1973. So this is two months after the war. Israel held the elections for the 8th Knesset. The elections were originally scheduled for October, but they were postponed due to the war. The left-wing party, the Labor Party, which had ruled Israel for 30 years, at that time they were called the Alignment. They lost five seats, but they still ended up as the largest party. And Golda Meir, the head of the party and the prime minister, she was tapped to form the next government. But her tenure as head of this government would be quite short-lived. After the war, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, Shimon Agranat, he was appointed to head a five-man commission to investigate the government's and the army's handling of the war. And the Agranat Commission's findings were released in April of 1974, in which the chief of staff, David Lazar and Eli Zeira, they were excoriated, while the prime minister and the defense minister were dubiously and inexplicably completely vindicated. And ironically, the complete exculpation of the prime minister and defense minister's guilt caused the calls for the resignation to grow even louder. And a week later, Golda Meir and her whole cabinet resigned. She was replaced as party leader and consequently as prime minister by Yitzhak Rabin. Rabin, he was the only one who was untainted by the war, given that he had just returned from serving as Israel's ambassador to the United States, and he had not served in any official capacity during the war, he was squeaky clean, and he was elected as the head of the Labor Party and as the prime minister. But of course, three years later, he too would have to resign as prime minister due to a financial scandal when he was in the United States, Acting as ambassador, he opened up an American bank account and they didn't close the bank account when they moved back to Israel and it was illegal at the time for Israelis, certainly not politicians, to hold foreign bank accounts. And when it was discovered that he was still holding a foreign bank account, that erupted into a scandal and he resigned. Now, David Lazar in the aftermath of the Agronaut Commission's findings, he resigned from the military. He was appointed as the head of Israeli shipping company Zim, but he died two years later from a heart attack at the age of 51. Moshe Dayan, he would have an improbable reappearance in Begin's government, and he played a role in the Camp David Accords, striking a peace deal with Egypt. In conclusion, it's my opinion that the central event, the tipping point in the trajectory of the history of the State of Israel, was the Yom Kippur War. In almost every way, the story, the history of the State of Israel can be divided into two eras before and after the Yom Kippur War. Geopolitically and diplomatically, the Yom Kippur War was the pivotal conflict that reshaped Israel's relationship with her neighbors. The Yom Kippur War, after all, was Israel's last war fought with a sovereign state, Egypt and Syria. The wars since were with non-state actors such as the PLO, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza. In fact, Abramovich astutely points out that, quote, the Yom Kippur War, despite its disastrous opening for Israel, had enhanced its military deterrence, not diminished it. It's hard to imagine a more propitious opening hand than the one Egypt and Syria dealt themselves in October of 1973, achieving strategic and tactical surprise in a two-front war, fought according to plans they had rehearsed for years and supported by a superpower, yet the war ended with the Israeli army on the road to the Cairo and Damascus. The chances of Israel ever permitting itself to be surprised like that again would appear unlikely. After the Yom Kippur War, 
Her Arab neighbors finally accepted the fact that Israel is here to stay. The war broke the diplomatic impasse, and in 1978, Egypt made peace with Israel. Jordan followed suit in 1994. Syria had always adamantly refused to recognize the legitimacy of the Jewish state, but since the disengagement agreement of 1974, the Israeli-Syrian border has been its quietest region. Beyond Israel's immediate borders over the course of the four and a half decades since the Yom Kippur War, many other Arab and African nations have developed stealth, diplomatic, and economic ties with Israel, many of these albeit unofficial. The internal political scene was also forever altered by the Yom Kippur War. In the elections following the war, the right-winged Likud party, led by Menachem Begin, won seven additional seats, bringing its total to 39 seats, a, a third essentially of the Knesset. While the nation was not quite yet ready to dispose of the Labour Party, its mystique, its invincibility were diminished, and four years later, the Mahapecha, the revolution of Menachem Begin, would sweep Israel's right into power, and with the exception of a few brief lapses, Israel's right has not left power ever since. In the 25 years from the founding of the state until the Yom Kippur War, the Israeli left was in power for all 25 years. In the 46 years since the Yom Kippur War, it has held power for only 11 of those years. I also think that the Yom Kippur War fundamentally changed the cultural and spiritual connection between the people and the state. In the decades preceding the war, Zionism, the ideology supporting the Jewish state, came in two competing forms. There were the religious Zionists and the secular Zionists. The religious Zionists, they believe that our connection to the land is rooted in the Torah, it's rooted in the Bible. And they look at the founding of the state as the first step towards the eventual Messiah, as predicted in Scripture. As such... The religious Zionists maintain that we have a mandate to secure and to inhabit every square inch of the land. Maybe it's appropriate to swap land for peace, but that has to be weighed in the prism of what attitude the Torah dictates that we should have regarding the land. Eventually, the religious Zionists, they want to institute Jewish law, Torah law, as the law of the land. And of course, the big move is to rebuild the temple, to reinstitute the Sanhedrin, to fulfill the messianic prophecies in the Torah. Secular Zionism, on the other hand, the ideology that largely founded and led the state since its inception, they view the founding of the state not as a first step of a messianic process, but as a standalone goal to build a liberal, maybe socialist democracy where Jews can have a homeland. That ideology was already waning, but the Yom Kippur War, when the secular Zionist establishment presided over an unprecedented debacle, was its death knell. Concurrently, the religious Zionist movement picked up steam in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. In the 70s, we see a very large uptick in the settlements in the areas of the land that are part of the biblical Israel but not yet incorporated, not yet annexed to the state, and that trend has yet to slow down. While there's been a huge emigration out of Israel by the secular Jews who had previously lived there. In addition, there was an acceleration of the tshuva, of the repentance movement in Israel after the Yom Kippur War. It began with the Six-Day War and the miracles that the soldiers experienced during that marvelous conflict, but it accelerated in the Yom Kippur War and its aftermath. Many individual soldiers returned home with miraculous stories of salvation to tell. Even in the immediate post-war period, when the Israeli units were still in Egypt, my grandfather, of blessed memory, Rabbi Shlomo Walby, he was commissioned to travel to Egypt to speak to and to inspire the Israeli soldiers stationed on Egyptian land. In fact, in volume two of his book, Alei Shur, he shares an interesting anecdote where he was on a plane flying over the Sinai 
And as they get to Egyptian territory, they start flying very low, like a few meters off the ground. And he thought there's something wrong with the plane. So he asks the pilot, why are we flying so low? He says, well, now we're in the Egyptian airspace and we have to fly beneath their radar. And my grandfather, the great Musser personality that he was, he took a Musser lesson from that, that sometimes when we want to accomplish our goal, we can't be too high and mighty about it. We have to act in a more humble, in a more inconspicuous manner and fly underneath the radar, so to speak, of the evil inclination. I want to end off with one amazing story that I heard. There was a rabbi named Rabbi Jacobson and he gets a call and there's two people who have a disagreement as to what is the proper blessing for watermelon. So we know that Jewish law states that before you consume any food, you have to make a blessing to thank God for the food that he's given you. And there's different categories of food and each type of food has a specific type of blessing. So six different categories of food and six different blessings. So given that a watermelon grows from the ground, the appropriate blessing for that kind of food is bore priyadama. We thank God that God created the fruits of the ground. So this rabbi gets a phone call and two people are having a dispute. What is the proper blessing for the watermelon? One guy says that it's Bore Priyadama, thanking God for the fruit of the ground. The other one insists that its blessing is indeed Shahakol Nebedvaro, the miscellaneous blessing, that everything is made because of the will of God. And the rabbi tells him, no, it's supposed to be the blessing on the fruit of the ground. So he says to him, no, it's supposed to be the other blessing. She says, well, why do you think that it's supposed to be the other blessing? So he tells him, that he was a soldier in the Sinai and they were in a tank and they were surrounded by all sides by enemy tanks. And the soldiers in the tank were certain that this is the last experience of the life. They're totally outmatched, outgunned by their enemies and they're all going to die. So one of the soldiers, he asks his comrades, Okay, we're about to die. Does anyone know any prayer? Does anyone know any blessing? So they all say no. No one, none of them. They were secular. They knew nothing. And one of them says, well, actually, I, th- I do know one prayer. And he says the blessing, Shakol Nyebedvaro. He makes the blessing, which is the miscellaneous blessing, which is said in all foods that don't fit into one of the five other categories. So they say the blessing and they just start firing in all directions. And miracle of all miracles, they're able to destroy their enemies and escape unscathed. So this soldier tells Rabbi Jacobson, he says, well, to me, there's only one blessing, Shakol Niebedvaro. That's the only blessing that I made. It's the blessing that saved my life. And it's the blessing that I'm going to say on the watermelon, which is, again, it's one anecdote. It's one story. But it does convey an attitude that was prevalent in the aftermath of this conflict, of this war, that yes, the Yom Kippur War saw colossal loss of life, but the fact that Israel recovered and managed to stem its losses, to win a decisive military victory, to not lose more than it did, is seen by many as a miracle. And of course, many of the soldiers have their own miraculous stories to share, and we have to be thankful for that. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. I know I promised to deliver this episode faster than I actually did, so I apologize for that. My email address is rabbiwolbegimo.com. I look forward to hearing from you.